Uh, this is Ashfaq. I'll be your moderator today, inshallah. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the third in the ICNA um, ILF um, online weekly Quran seminars. Um, today's um, webinar is titled How Do You Perfect? How Do You Prepare for Your Biggest Challenge? And this will be delivered by Brother Kia Jahid, who's on the webcam. And the verses that we will be dealing with today are from Surah uh, Muzammu, uh, verses 1 to 10 and verse 20. So with that, uh, I will hand over to Brother Kia. Jazakallah Kia. Rahim. <coughs> Alhamdulillah wa salat wa salam ala rasulil kareem wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlu luqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli Alhamdulillah um, Jazakallah khair um, Ikna for uh, putting this program together and making this um, uh, um, possible um, to come together even through electronic means to remember the um, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to say something that's beneficial, remind one another of, of, uh, of taqwa, fa'ina dhikra tanfa'ul mu'mineen. Um, that's all this is. It's just a reminder. The reminder benefits the believer. And um, my name is um, Kia Jahid. I'm a physician out of uh, Virginia um, <clears throat> and uh, a student of, of knowledge, just like many of you. And I was asked to say a few words about um, some of the verses in Surah Muzammil and make them applicable and relevant to our daily life. Um, and so I think what we'll do um, is um, I'll talk about the occasion of revelation briefly. And then I'll talk about, let's just do a brief run through and just translate what we're going to talk about. And then go back and talk about um, the verses in much more um, uh, in, in more detail and then extract the lessons um, from that. And then I think afterwards we'll have like 10 minutes or so, 10, 15 minutes where people can type in questions or, or ask questions in whatever way you want. And if, um, um, if, I, if I don't know, I'll say I don't know. And if I know, and if I have something good to say, that's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, Bismillah rahman rahim the occasion of a revelation, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, after he received that very first revelation of Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. It's important to understand something. That was not something he was wanting or something he was expecting. He was looking for answers. He was pondering the uh, the nature of his society, the malakuti fi samawati wal ard, the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was pondering these things and he was reflective and looking was a seeker, but he definitely did not want what was coming to him. He wasn't after it. And so when this angel Jibreel comes to him with 600 wings, filling the horizon, squeezing him, saying, Iqra, read. And the Prophet Muhammad says, I cannot read. And Allah says about the angel Jibreel, alayhi salam, Allamahu shadidu al-quwa. This angel Jibreel, he is intensely powerful. So this angel is squeezing him, saying, read. And this is coming out of nowhere. This is a very traumatic experience for the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he's going to respond just like any other human being. Uh, keep in mind, the Prophet Muhammad is a human being just like any other human being. I am a human just like any of you. And if that were to happen to any one of us, we would feel traumatized, we would feel scared. The Prophet Muhammad felt scared. He felt maybe he was afflicted with a jinn um, and he didn't know. And by the way, this is a proof of the honesty and of the truthfulness of, of what had happened to him because this isn't something you can make up. This is the natural reaction of a human being 
to a situation like this, right? So he runs down the mountain and he runs to his one source of safety and security, which is Khadija radiallahu anha. And she tells her, Zanni Luni Zanni, cover me up, cover me up, right? Um, and she covers him up. And so <clears throat> the next revelation, and it's not clear exactly when, but um, the Mufassirun, many of them will say that the next revelation to come to the Prophet Muhammad then, whether he was in this state of uh, being covered or in retreat, right, for uh, however long that he was, whether it was days or hours or weeks, the very next revelation to come to him was the revelation of Surah Muzammil. Um, so this was the kind of the occasion for revelation. We're going to read the first few um, uh, verses up to the 10th verse, and then we're going to read the 20th verse, and then we're going to talk about them more in detail. But let's briefly just kind of translate what we're going to talk about. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal muzzammil, O you who are wrapped up, qumil layla illa qalila. Stand up for prayer at night, except for some of it. Nisfahu, or half of it, aw in qusminhu qalila, or take some away, aw zid alayhi, or add some to that. Wa ratili al-Qur'an tartila. And recite the Qur'an with a measured recitation. Inna sanuqin alayka qawlan taqila. We are going to send down upon you a heavy word. Indeed, the late hours of night are uh, more firm for your footing and more stable for your speech. You have throughout the day affairs to take care of. So remember the name of your Lord and devote yourself to him with an utter devotion. Rabbul Mashriqi wal Maghribi la ilaha illahu fattakhidhu wakila. Lord of the East and the West, there's no God but he. Take him as someone to take care of your affairs, wakil. The 20th verse then um, continues. There's other verses then that we're going to skip. But then the 20th verse continues where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah knows indeed that you're going or that you stand less than a third or half or two thirds of the night. You and um, a group of believers with you. Indeed, Allah is the one who uh, measures the night and the day. He knows indeed that you cannot calculate the portions of the night. So read what is easy for you. He knows that there are amongst you people who are sick. There are amongst you people who are traveling, seeking the bounty of God. There are amongst you people who are fighting in the sake of Allah. So establish prayer and give charity and give God a good loan. And whatever you give um, uh, for the sake of God, you will find it, you will find it um, better and more in reward and seek forgiveness of Allah. And Allah is indeed oft forgiving, most merciful. So this is what we're going to talk about a little bit more in detail now. Beginning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins by saying, Ya ayyuhal muzzamil, O you who are wrapped up. One thing that's interesting, um, Nowhere in the Quran does Allah say, Ya Muhammad. Nowhere in the Quran does he call him out by his name Muhammad. He refers to him as Ya Yuhal Rasul, O Messenger. Ya Yuhal Nabi, O Prophet. Ya Yuhal Mudathir, um, one who is wrapped up. Mudathir is one who is wrapped up in light clothing. Uh, ya Yuhal Muzammil, one who is wrapped up in heavy clothing. The only places where he uses Muhammad in the Qur'an is as a khabar, like just as an informative thing. Muhammadun Rasulullah. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Uh, for example, in, um, in Surah Fat. So here Allah is referring to him in kind of a state that he's in. And this is in the, uh, in, you know, in the Arabic language, not just Arabic language, in English as well. If you call someone out by their nickname, 
right? Or you call them out by a name that's only familiar to you and that person, that's a sign of closeness, right? That's a sign, that's, that's a way in which you remove the formality of the communication, right? And you bring this element of closeness there. Right. So if I if I call you, hey, Mr. Abdullah, you know, that's very formal. Right. But if I but if I say, hey, bro, you know, that's very informal. Right. And so the more I use an informal nickname, the more I'm suggesting comfort, the more I'm suggesting closeness, the more I'm suggesting this. This is not something that uh, it goes through um, some kind of like formal unfamiliar ritual, right? So that is, that's the first thing to understand. Muzammil can have different meanings. One of the meanings is someone who's wrapped up in clothing, whether in, you're wrapped up in your bedding or you're wrapped up just in regular clothing. It could also mean someone who's carrying a burden. And this is gonna become relevant in some of the stuff we're gonna say later. But <clears throat> for example, in the books of Sirah, when, it's, when Abu Bakr was preparing the camels, for uh, Hijrah, he had one camel for the Prophet Muhammad, one camel for himself, and he had one camel to carry the burdens, and that that was referred to as uh, as Muzammi. That camel was was carrying a burden, and so uh, Zemi, the idea in Arabic, can also be one of uh, someone who's about to carry a burden. Now, this is going to become uh, relevant in the other verses that we're going to get to in a moment as well. And then Allah says, "Call me late." Stand at night for prayer. Now this is really important. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is about to embark on a tremendous mission. And he doesn't quite know it yet. He doesn't know what this is going to entail. He doesn't know the severity of this mission and the importance of it. But Allah knows. And just like if you were to tackle any task in life that was extremely, extremely tasking of you um, and taxing of you, uh, you would have to prepare for it in some way, right? If you're about to engage in some kind of job that's extremely physical, you would need to take some time to get strong, physically strong, right? If you were about to engage in a job that is mentally very stressful, you would mentally have to prepare for that for some time. Now, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu is about to prepare for the most difficult job on the face of this earth. He's about to take humanity from darkness to light. He's about to change an entire mindset of society. He's about to change the entire framework of, 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 of spiritual settings in a society to go from polytheism to monotheism, to go from injustice to justice. He's about to engage in wars. He's about to lose family members. He lost his wife because of a three-year boycott that was put on Beni Hashem. He's going to lose every single one of his children, except Fatima, before he dies. He's going to lose so many of his Sahaba. He's going to suffer so much pressure. He has to be prepared. And so when you prepare for something, you have to train. And the best training ground, the best training ground is a training ground in which you've removed all of the distractions. And you can just focus on strengthening your skills, right? And at night, all the distractions are gone. At night, all the hustle and bustle of the day is gone. At night, all of the... Uh, uh, Texting and Twitter and Facebook and everything is gone. And the only thing, and you've got to imagine at that time, there was absolutely no stimulation. There was no light. It was completely dark, right? There was no sounds to be made, that, you know, other than what's out in nature. You know, they didn't have cell phones. They didn't have all these distractions we have now. So the night for them was truly the time in which you could work on yourself and focus on and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qumi lay illa qalila. Now this was an obligation for the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa This initially came as an obligation. And we're going to talk about the end of the end of the surah, how that changed. But this initially came as an obligation for the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and for his companions every night to stand for Qiyamul Layl and to the, do the best they can, as Allah says, in the rest of the verse for half of it or a little bit less than half or a little bit more than half. 
Now, think about that for a moment. How would they actually calculate all of that, right? Isn't that a little bit difficult to calculate? Half of the night, and you know, nowadays we've got like Islamic Finder, we can see exactly when Maghrib comes in, and we know exactly when Fajr comes in, and we can kind of calculate the third of this and the third of that. But back then it was extremely difficult, right? And you had Sahaba who were saying, you know, we used to stand the entire night out of fear that we would possibly miss um, half of it, or two thirds of it, or one third of it. And so <clears throat> This was like a, a very difficult thing to do. Um, and one has to wonder how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give them a command and then say later, I know that you're not able to do it, as we'll see here in a minute. What, what that actually means, right? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, You know, قُمِ اللَّيْلَ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا نِسْفَهُ وَأَوْنْ قُسْمِنْهُ قَلِيلًا أَوْزِدَ عَلَيْهِ وَرَأْتِ لِلْقُرْآنَ تَرْتِيلًا Pray half of it, or a little bit less than half, or a little bit more than half. And then recite the Qur'an in a measured recitation. Tartil is qira'atan bayinatan. It is a, a recitation that is very clear. Qira'atan, um, that, uh, it, it is a recitation, as Ibn Mas'ud says, um, you know, uh, it's not like a, like a simple dictation. Um, and it's not like, the, uh, it's not like the, the rhythm that you have in a poem. But, um, but it is a qira'a that is clear, concise, and careful, right? Clear, concise, and careful. Qira'atan tusmi'uha al-udhan, as Ibn Abbas says, it is a recitation that will make your ears hear, wa yu'iha qal, and it will make your heart understand. And the word ratal in the Arabic language is for something to be measured. Uh, they used to say about the front teeth, like if they were spaced out just a little bit, not too much, they would say that it, الثغر, is the front teeth. They would say that it is spaced, the teeth are spaced out just enough. So the idea of ratil or tartil is that something is spaced out just right, it's measured just right. The Prophet Muhammad, when he would recite, he would recite verse and then a stop, and then a verse and then stop, and then a verse and then stop. And it was, it was a recitation that was effective and understood. And every, every letter had its right, right? Not kind of like nowadays that you see in some tahajjuds or in some um, tarawih, if you will, where the goal seems to be just to get it done in a certain amount of time. And it's so fast you can barely even understand what is being heard. So that wasn't the recitation of the Prophet Muhammad. The recitation of the Prophet Muhammad was clear, concise, and careful to give every letter its right. And then Allah says, We are about to send down upon you a very weighty word. And this is the idea of why the Prophet Muhammad has to stand in Qiyamul He has to stand in Qiyamul because he's about to receive a very heavy message and he has to have the training of his nafs to be able to handle that. Otherwise, he won't be able to handle it. And now this becomes very relevant for every single one of us. Whenever we have a challenge in life, whenever we have a certain difficulty in life, if there is um, something that we do on a mental level to prepare for that or something that we do on a physical level to prepare for that, that's good. But the most important thing to prepare for is the spiritual preparation. The Prophet Muhammad is about to be given a task to guide an entire ummah, all of humanity, to Sirat al Mustaqim. So now, for him, that preparation is very important. But it's also important for us. Whatever challenge that we're going through in life, whatever difficulty that we're going through in life, the spiritual preparation is the most important. You're always going to be tempted. You're always going to be tasked. You're always going to be forced to be patient. You're always going to be forced to dig in and find a capacity within yourself that maybe you didn't know that you had to dig in to find. So the spiritual preparation is always the most important preparation. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we are about to send upon you a weighty word. Now, Fakhr al-Din al-Razi in his Tafsir al-Kabir gives 10 different meanings for what a weighty word here is. And we're not going to go over all of them, but 
Um, for example, one of the meanings is, is just a literal meaning, that the Qur'an was extremely weighty to the Prophet Muhammad. When he would receive the Qur'an, he used to say, It would come to me like, like the ringing of a bell. Like that's how intense it was. And Aisha, radiallahu anha, she would say, لَقَدْ رَأَيْتُهُ يَنْزِلُ عَلَيْهِ فِي الْيَوْمِ الشَّدِيدِ الْبَرْفَ فَيَصْرِمُ عَنْهُ uh, I would see him on a very cold night. I would see the revelation come to him. And, and he would go unconscious. And it would be extremely cold. And I would see beads of sweat come over his forehead. Just beads of sweat. That's how intense it was for him. And sometimes if he was on a camel, that camel would have to come down. Like the weight of the Qur'an, if he was getting revelation while he was on a camel... The weight of the Qur'an coming to the Prophet Muhammad would cause the camel to have to come down and just kind of, uh, 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 you know, relax on the ground because the weight of the revelation was too much. Some companions, even if they were sitting next to the Prophet Muhammad and their thigh was touching the thigh of the Prophet Muhammad and revelation came to him at that point, it was so heavy that even the weight of his thigh became unbearable for the companion who was sitting next to him. So that the weightiness of the message has a literal meaning, but of course it also has a metaphorical meaning. That this this responsibility is extremely heavy. This responsibility inna aradna al amana ta'ala samawati wal ardi wal jibal fa abayna an yahmilha wa ashfaqna minha. We offer this responsibility to the heavens and the earth and the mountains. Right? Allah says in the Quran, we even offered it to the mountains. Now, how strong is a mountain? How powerful is a mountain? Right? That mountain even refused it. And so if a mountain that is that powerful can refuse to take that responsibility, what then does the Prophet Muhammad have to do? What does he have to do in order to carry this responsibility? He has to stay that night. And Allah says, in the nashiyata layhi ashaddu wata'a. Those wee hours of the night, the nashia, nashia in the Arabic language, you can have two different meanings according to um, the ulama. It can be simply the things that happen at night, right? Or it can be the hours of night. Now, Fakhruddin al-Razi, he says that it's not just the things that happen at night, it's what happens within you. It is the happening of your um, Someone might need to mute their microphone. Um, and those happenings, those are the um, those are the spiritual insights that come to you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you're so cut off from everything else um, uh, that um, the only thing that's left is that connection that you have to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So those insights, those spiritual insights, those gems, those flashes of light, those are what Fakhruddin al-Razi calls the nashia. He ashaddu wata. And at that time, your feet are more firm. You know how you're like throughout the day, you're so distracted um, that when you come to pray, you're extremely fidgety in the salah. Like you want to scratch your hair, you want to move your arm, you want to move your foot. Uh, ashaddu wata as the exact opposite of that. It's when you're so stable, your feet are so stable on the ground that, um, that you have no tendency whatsoever to be fidgety. Now, there's another recitation of the Qur'an. Instead of saying wata'a, there's another recitation of wita'a, right? And wita'a is different. It means harmony. So those wee hours of the night, another meaning here could be that those wee hours of the night, there are a time in which there's greater harmony between your tongue and your heart. Whatever you're saying is more understood by your heart. Um, and, um, and more stable in speech. So whatever you're saying, you're much more likely to understand. This is the training ground. This is the preparation. This is where the nafs gets built up. This is where the soul gets stronger. This is where you become... Uh, more complete and more capable now as a human being to handle those burdens, to handle those pressures, to handle those difficulties that are going to come later to you in life. Just like you have to go to the gym to lift weights to get stronger, to handle the physical stresses of life, this is what you have to do to get stronger internally, to handle the uh, the fitan, 
the tests, the trials, and the difficulties that come in life. This is what you need. This is your training ground. And unless you're doing this to prepare, you're going to fail when you go out there in the real life. You're going to fail when you go out there on the field. And you're not going to be able to take it. You have throughout the day all kinds of affairs to take care of. So remember the name of your Lord. And Tabatul is to cut off the idea like Maryam al Batul. Maryam, one of the names of Maryam salams al Batul, because she cut herself off from everyone else, completely devote to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the idea of tabatil is when you cut yourself off from all of your attachments and all of your distractions and all of your um, iltifat, like where your mind goes in the dunya, you cut yourself off from all of that to be solely focused and solely devout to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's a process, that takes time, that takes years. But the best place to begin to do that is in the wee hours of night. When you already don't have those distractions, you don't have those texts coming to you, you don't have those emails that you have to check, you don't have all of those uh, <clears throat> daily distractions that are coming from the stock market or they're coming from work or they're coming from phone calls or they're coming from family members. The best place to practice teptil uh, um, or when you cut yourself off from everything to be devoted only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is those wee hours of night. Now, this was an obligation for the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu and for his companions. And as the ulama of tafsir mentioned, this was an obligation for about 12 months. Aisha radiallahu anha in one of the narrations about this, she says, أمسك الله he held it like Allah SWT literally held the last parts of the verse, the last parts of this surah for 12 months. So this is all he got initially in the revelation. This is all he got. The last part, the last part of the surah, verse 20, didn't come for another year. Why is that significant? Because the last part is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually then making tahajjud optional. And I think I'm getting um, uh, a text here to conclude. And I'll, I'll conclude with this, because this is the really important point here. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says in verse 20, Allahu an tuhsuhu. Allah knows you were never actually able to fully calculate how much you were supposed to stand in life. Because remember in the beginning, Allah says, stand for half of it or a little bit less or a little bit more. Then here in verse 20, he says, Allah knows you were never ever actually able to do that. Now, why would he say that? Why would he say that? Why would he say, uh, here's what you have to do. Here's the commandment that I'm giving you. And then right after that, a year later, after they've been doing it for a year, and some companions would say we would stand the whole night in prayer out of fear of not being able to know what half the night was. After all of that, after one year, when these when this last verse was revealed, after 12 months, would Allah say, Alim Allahu, Alim He knows that you were never actually able to do it the way that you were supposed to do it. Why? Because the goal here, the point here, was never to just calculate the time. It was never to just pray in a certain amount of time or at a certain point of the day. And of course, praying the last part of the night, the last third of the night is the best. And we know the hadith in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends in a manner befitting his majesty in the last third of the night saying, who will seek my mercy? Who will ask something so I can give it to him? Who will ask for forgiveness so I can forgive him? And, and that is the best. But the point was this training for one year or this growth process for one year to simply strive and struggle even though they weren't able to actually do it to the point in which they were supposed to the goal here was to simply strive and struggle and through that striving and struggling through that praying in the wee hours of night allow their soul to grow and to blossom and to engage in this process of tarbiya, which is like you take a seed, you plant it in the ground, and you feed it, you give it water and soil, and you allow it to become a tree. 
and to give its fruit um, um, in, in all measures um, capable. And so the growth process is really what this surah is about. It is about the process of growing, the process of struggling, the process of striving. We know that um, Rasulullah said, Laylatul Qadr is in the last uh, of the odd nights of, of Ramadan. But which night? He doesn't tell us which night. Some say to the 20th, but there's a narration about the 29th. There's a narration about the 20th. There are Sahaba who swear it's the 23rd. There are There's narrations about the 21st. Why is it not clear so that you can strive all of those nights to find it? Because it is in the process of striving in which you grow. There's an hour on Friday in which if you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is promised to give you whatever you're asking for. But that's not clear what that hour is. Why? Because Allah wants you to ask him constantly, constantly throughout the day, right? It is in the process of asking him that you become closer to him. In fact, Ibn Qayyim says in one of his books of dua that sometimes Allah will purposely not give you what you're asking for simply because the process of making dua is what's making you draw closer to him. And so what is important for a Muslim for someone who is on the path of coming to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, someone who's on the path of repentance is to understand that the growth mindset is ultimately what's most important in Islam. You're never going to get there, but you're always going to struggle and strive. And in the process of that struggling and striving, that's when you grow, right? The, the Arab, and I'll just end on this, the Arab came to the Prophet Muhammad and they would say, um, Amen, we believe, right? And <clears throat> Allah says to the Prophet Muhammad, respond to them, Lam tu'minu, you don't believe. Walakin qulu aslamna, but say that we have submitted. And then he says this, tell them, Walamma yadukhli al-imanu fi qulubikum. Iman has not yet entered your heart. Lamma in the Arabic language means not yet. And I would just end on this by saying, all of tazkiyah to nafs can be summarized by this one lemma. All of it can be summarized by this understanding of not yet. You're not yet there, right? You're struggling and you're striving, and you're always going to be struggling and you're striving, but there's no end point to get to. Your whole life is going to be a struggle, and it's going to be a striving to seek um, the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a really good book on this if anyone is interested, actually. Hikmatul Dalatul Muslim, Wisdom is the Lost Property of the Believer. I would recommend this book, um, Carol Dweck, Mindset. And this is a really, um, a really um, popular book across all educational fields in America, but it's all about this idea that as human beings, we can have a fixed mindset, right, in things that we do. Um, and it's all about the numbers, it's all about the end goal, it's all about uh, achieving something at the end, or we could have a growth mindset in which we define success through the process rather than um, the, the end product. And so um, the process of growth, this is what gave the Prophet Muhammad and his companions in that one year, that growth is what gave them the capacity to receive the revelation and to act upon it and to grow with it, and to change society with it. And if we also as Muslims want to change society, and we want to change ourselves, and we want to transform ourselves, we should give a little bit of time in those wee hours of night, which are more intense in understanding, more stable in our footing, and where we're completely cut off from all our distractions, um, to seek that closeness with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to grow bit by bit. أَقُولِ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَأَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ فَاسْتَغْفِرُهُ إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفَرًا Jazakallah khair, um, Brother Kia. That's um, really very uh, inspirational. So, inshallah, we'll take some uh, questions from the audience. Um, as a reminder, the methodology is to use the questions tab within the webinar uh, and submit your questions in, in writing. And inshallah, I will uh, moderate those. So, our first question, inshallah um, What motivational or maybe practical advice would you give to the person who struggles to wake up to perform tahajjud uh, this is the person who, who wants to 
um, they want to start or they want to try and make it a, into a routine. Uh, what's the best way for that person to motivate themselves to either get started or, or to make their practice more regular? So there's a couple things. One, just like any other um, American, you know, Muslims, we struggle with sleep hygiene. You know, sleep hygiene is something that's real. And, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, just to start with the very basic things, right? Not drinking caffeine, for example, like after one o'clock or two o'clock, where you're staying up till two, three a.m. in the morning. You know, the Prophet Muhammad, it was makruf for him to have like conversations after Aisha, right? And to like sit around and <clears throat> and just like gossip or have a, even even not gossiping, just having conversations, like anything after Aisha. The Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad was to just go to bed right after Aisha. That was the Sunnah. Right. And, there, you know, at that time, there weren't distractions like there are today. So we have to be even more careful about that. Like there wasn't coffee. There wasn't tea. You, know, you drink tea has caffeine and you drink tea 6, 7 p.m., 8 p.m., 9 p.m. You're not even going to fall asleep until 1 p.m., 2 p.m. or 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. It's going to be very difficult to wake up, you know, 30 minutes before Fajr, an hour before Fajr at that point. Right. Uh, sleeping after Aisha is and not doing anything. Um, not having hyper stimulation to your eyes, like uh, excessive like phone time can, you know, just from a medical point of view, it can, you know, hyper stimulate um, your mind um, and, you know, your, your, your brain is confused. It's looking at something bright. It thinks it's daytime and you do that, you know, constantly, it's going to be hard to fall asleep at a consistent time. And so just putting your phone away, like the last hour, um, you know, uh, before you go to bed and just not letting your eye hit too much screen time is something that could help a lot um, just to go to bed a little bit early. So just, you know, basic things with sleep hygiene um, are, are important. Um, and, you know, the, the other thing is it, it doesn't have to be something major. You know, if you wake up for Fedger, just waking up a few minutes before Fajr, and even praying two rakats, 15 minutes before Fajr comes in, is considered to hajjud, right? It's considered to hajjud. Um, and so, um, you know, keep in mind that a little bit, to do something consistently, even if it's a little bit, is better than to do something sporadically, even if it's a lot. So, um, Two rakats and reciting faqaro mati as Allah says in the Quran, reciting whatever is easy for you is more valuable in the sight of Allah, right? Than um, than standing the whole night in prayer and finding that extremely difficult and just getting bored by that. Because there's another tradition that says Allah does not become tired of you until you become tired of Him. And so doing it in a way in which is actually enjoyable for you. In which you can actually be focused and you can actually uh, understand what you're doing is what's actually is what's important again it's the growth that occurs in this process if that's what I'm about, then that's what's important yeah. okay so the next question why does it appear that some individuals and in particular non-muslims are internally strong and able to handle the test trials and difficulties that come in life in such a steady or stable form with goodness and light, even without heeding steadfast, steadfastness in prayers. We know they too are creations of Allah. What is the relevance of them being able to succeed without this soul strengthening process? There was an experiment that was done in the 1970s. Um, there's a really good book by a person named Roy Bonmister. It's called Willpower. Um, it's another really good book I would recommend. Um, and he's generally considered one of the most prominent psychologists in America. The whole book is about willpower. The whole book is about this, what is this idea that, you know, some people have the capacity to do things and handle things more than other people. And it's not even, doesn't even look at religion in any of it. But one of the things that's mentioned in the book, and it's a well-known experiment in the 1970s or 80s, they did this experiment where they put chocolate chip cookies in front of kids and they told the kids, you can have one cookie right now, right? 
We'll put a cookie in front of you. You can have it. We have one right now, right away. Or if you wait 15 minutes, we'll give you two, right? So some of the kids took one cookie right there and then. They couldn't wait. And some of them waited. And, you know, you had to wait looking at the cookie in front of you. And so it was extremely tempting. So they, they waited. Then they followed these kids up over decades. They followed them up to see, like, how successful they became, what jobs they had, how much money they earned, how happy they were in their marriages, how they handled the difficulties of their life. Those kids who waited 15 minutes for two cookies, in other words, they demonstrated just a little bit of patience on all aspects of their life. And they were followed for years and years and years. They had higher GPAs. They got into better colleges. They um, got better jobs. They handled the difficulties of their life better and had much lower divorce rates. The point I'm getting at is patience is a quality of insan, right? And sabah. It's just a quality of it. It's not a religious. It, it's not something that if you have, if you're a Muslim, you have patience. And if you're not a Muslim, you don't. Now, this is something Allah created in the human being. Allah inspired in the human being its notions of right and wrong, and those notions can be developed. Whether you're a no, whether you're a Muslim or not, those virtues of patience, those virtues of of goodwill, those virtues of, um, you know, <clears throat> um, tolerance, forbearance, all of these things are, um, these are akhlaqul insaniya, and they're in every one of us. The point, though, the point, though, is on the day of judgment, all of these traits, even if they were put to good, if they did not have the right intention behind them, on the day of judgment, they will not count for good deeds. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says at the end of Surah Kaf, Should we not tell you of people who are the biggest losers in their deeds? Right? People who thought that they were doing good. They thought that their actions were good actions in this life. And, you know, they considered their actions Good actions, sunnah, like good good deeds. These are people who disbelieved in the ayat of Allah and they disbelieved that they were going to stand before Allah one day and answer for everything they did. Uh, so all of their deeds have gone to waste. All of their deeds have gone to it. So these qualities, these humanity, these are just qualities of humanity. They can be developed by any human being as long as you struggle and strive against your nafs, right? As long as you exercise, you know, these basic exercises of willpower, like we mentioned that experiment, you know, even a kid can do. These can develop and these can grow in any human being. Ultimately, though, ultimately, though, what allows a human being to see the fruits of their action in the next life is when they are done with the right intention to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And condition number two, they are done in accordance to the teachings or principles of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Everything else in the sight of Allah, even if it's even if it does good in this life, it doesn't count in the next. Jazakallah. So inshallah we'll end just with two two very quick questions, inshallah. Um, firstly can you repeat the title and the author of the book that you cited? Will and, um, the name of the book, um, and it's by, I think, Roy Baumister is his name. If just Google it, you'll find it. Um, and then the other book was um, Mindset by Carol Dweck. She's got a good TED Talk on that. As, as well. And again, hikmatul dalat with Muslim. You know, wisdom is the lost property of the believer. Wherever we find it, we claim it. And then the final question Does one have to pray with her again after praying tahajjud? So the Prophet Muhammad says, um, Make witr the last prayer of 
your night. Make with her the last prayer of, of your night. So the very last prayer that you make before the prayer of Fajr, or you know, before you go to sleep again for Fajr, should be the Witter prayer. So you should not pray Witter and then go to bed with the intention that you're going to get up for Qiyamul Layl. You should delay Witter um, as the very last prayer that you do after Qiyamul Layl. After Qiyamul Layl. And um, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he would pray two rakahs, four rakahs, six rakahs, eight rakahs, qiyamul layl. Um, and then, you know, um, he would pray shafa two rakahs, and then he would pray witr, one rakah after that. So um, if one knows that they're not going to get up for qiyamul layl, then you should pray witr before you go to bed. But if you know that you're going to get up and you're going to pray qiyamul layl, then you should delay it until after, um, after the qiyamul layl. So with that, we will conclude, inshallah. So uh, I'd like to thank uh, Brother Kia for uh, today's um, uh, lecture. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq to act on what we learned. Uh, inshallah, next week, we'll continue again at the same time, 9 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, and we'll be uh, looking at um, verses 1 to 7 of Surah Al-Hadid. And this will be delivered by Imam Jawad Ahmed. Um, so, Jazakallah khair. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruk wa atubu ilaik. Audu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Wal asr. Inna l-insana la fi khusr. Illa al-lazina amanu wa amilu s-sanihat. Wa tawasaw bil haq. Wa tawasaw bil sabr. Sadaqallahu al-lazim. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.